Okay, well, hello everyone. So while everyone is still trickling in, um, I want to welcome all of you to our final ISHR Mid-Career Investigator Webinar of the Year. I'm Mark Poor. I'm the Associate Professor at the Johns Hopkins School, uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. And uh, we have two wonderful speakers in store for you today, uh, Dr. Michael Tranter from The Ohio State University and Dr. Li Ming Pei from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, before we begin, though, I just have a couple of quick announcements. Um, so as most of you are likely aware, the Mid-Career Investigator Committee was created uh, by Mid-Career Investigators to support Mid-Career Investigators at a critical stage in their career. Um, we're a committee that provides the support through a number of different avenues, and that includes uh, organizing things like uh, MCI symposia at section and World Congress meetings. Uh, we also provide a number of MCI awards, and we also have some additional initiatives that include this uh, webinar series, um, which has been quite successful in its first year. Uh, so this is our fourth installation, and we are planning to continue the series into future years. So if you're interested in supporting your fellow MCIs as a member of this committee, uh, or you're simply interested in presenting in this webinar series, uh, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, bring you onto the committee or, or have you present. Um, and finally, I just wanted to remind everyone of the upcoming 2024 ISHR North American Section meeting that's going to take place in Long Beach, California. Um, that's going to be happening in August of this year, and it's going to be uh, hosted by uh, Cedar sinai in UCLA, and uh, Dr. Pei Pei Ping and Dr. Jenny Van Eyck are are both, uh, are both co-chairs of that meeting. So um, as MCIs, we're going to be organizing an MCI program. We're also going to give out a couple of MCI awards. Uh, so please look out for correspondence from us regarding these awards, as well as call for abstracts and oral presentations. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jessica Flegler, who will be moderating our seminar today. Uh, but I also want to mention that we're going to make a minor change to our format. Um, our speakers will present for 25 minutes each, um, and then we're going to save the Q&A for both speakers until the end of the session. Uh, so please hold your questions until the end. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica. And thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Mark. So like Mark said, my name is Jessica Flager. I'm an assistant professor at the Freeland Biomedical Research Institute at Virginia Tech. Um, and we're going to get started with Dr. Mike Tranter. Um, he's an associate professor in the Department of Molecular Medicine and Therapeutics at The Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. Um, his lab focuses on investigating post-transcriptional regulation in different cardiac disease states. And today, I think he's going to be telling us about these processes in cardiometabolic disease. So Mike can share his slides and get going. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Jess, for the introduction. Thanks, Mark. And uh, thanks to the committee for inviting me and letting me uh, let me give this talk today. So... I yeah so my my lab has a few different focuses and and for starters we so we just moved to the Ohio State University so we were at Cincinnati up until just a few months ago um so we're still settling into our new home in a beautiful new research building here and oh, make sure I can advance these slides so to give kind of a a brief little history and overview of my lab and what we do so I I started my independent lab in 2012 and at that point, and still, still today, we're heavily focused on cardiovascular disease at the heart of you know, molecular signaling in the myocardium, pathological cardiac remodeling, focusing both on the cardiac myocytes and the fibroblasts. And then you know, a, a handful of years later, around 2016, we started also getting interested in obesity and adipose tissue. And so there are a couple of core projects in the lab that I'm not going to talk about today that are focused on adipocyte physiology, both both brown adipose tissue and white adipose tissue. And then, of course, you know, it, it made sense to, to kind of also combine these two things because, you know, adipose tissue physiology has a large impact on the heart. And so there's another, another project or multiple projects really in the lab looking at how adipose tissue and disruptions in adipose tissue homeostasis and things like obesity and aging affect cardiac physiology. 
Um, and and so before I go into any of this, right, I want to start up front with the acknowledgements. And so this picture shows you what our lab looked like just prior to the pandemic. And I'm leaving this up for now because Sam Sloan over here, can you guys hang on a second? Let me get the laser pointer. There we go. So this is Sam Sloan and Lisa Green, the first two PhD students from the lab. And they contributed uh, a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and they're both relatively recent. Both of them have been gone from the lab for about a year. Sam is now a postdoc with Wally Koch at Duke now. And Lisa Green is a postdoc with Sakti Satyapan at UC. And then uh, Sarah in my lab has moved with us to Ohio State. And Adrian is finishing up her PhD working on an adipose tissue project. And, and this is a more updated photo. Uh, Sharon, new grad student in the lab. Pujan, new postdoc of us outside our new lab space here at Ohio State. So I, I kind of, I start with this slide regardless of which talk I'm going to give because the obesity epidemic and cardiovascular disease go hand in hand, right? And so both are increasing. And if you overlay the map of the obesity prevalence in the U.S. with cardiovascular disease, um, you know, they, they overlap very, very nicely, right? And, and you can see that in the Midwest here where we are, um, Ohio is, is sort of in the epicenter of, of this. And so the talk that I'm going to give today is, is mostly going to focus on, on pathological cardiac remodeling. And, and the way my lab approaches this, right, is, is, you know, it's much more complex than this, but we kind of oversimplify it into focusing really on the cardiomyocytes and the cardiac fibroblasts and how they contribute to this process. And so the, the models that we typically use are pressure overload, so uh, the aortic constriction or ischemia reperfusion. And upon this pathological stimulus, right, you have changes directed at both the cardiomyocyte and the fibroblast. And then it's also important to keep in mind that these two cell types are, are in constant communication with each other, right? So the fibroblast feeding hypertrophic signaling to the myocytes and the myocytes feeding uh, profibrotic signaling to, to the fibroblast. But the end result of this is, is typically myocyte loss, myocyte apoptosis and cell death, right? Myocyte hypertrophy, and activation of these quiescent cardiac fibroblasts into myofibroblasts, which then leads to, you know, remodeling of that ECM and, and the deposition of cardiac fibrosis. And the other thing that, that we kind of focus in on as we take, take this uh, molecular approach is this, this RNA binding protein called human antigen R or HUR. And so this protein let me see, my little, my little video is not going to play. This is just a, a 3D model over here that shows you the two RNA recognition motifs, the RM1 and 2, binding to a target RNA. And, and it typically, so these RNA binding proteins, they kind of recognize target sequence more on, on 3D structure. And so it's typically these AU-rich hairpin loops that HUR binds to. And when it, when it binds, the typical, uh, the most common effect is RNA stabilization and promoting expression of target RNAs. And, and so because this talk is gonna focus on QR in the cardiomyocyte and the cardiac fibroblast, I wanna show this slide. So a lot of what, what we knew about QR coming into this was from the cancer field. And so um, this slide takes that approach of, of what does QR do in a cancer cell, right? And if you look at the things, right? So proliferation, um, survival, uh, you know, all of all of these things, migration, these are these are processes that we can immediately say, oh, you know, cardiac fibroblasts do these in, in pathological remodeling as well. So it, it kind of makes sense that uh, you know QR might play a role in the cardiac fibroblast. But we'll we will come back to all of that. So so the QR protein itself, when it's when it's inactive, it sets kind of in the in the nucleus. And then upon some activating stimulus, the typical course of action is that it becomes phosphorylated. And it binds to target RNAs via these AU-rich hairpin loops, and then translocates into the cytoplasm with the target RNA bound. And as I said, the, the typical downstream effect then is the stabilization of that target RNA and promotion of translation and expression. And on the activation side, we, we have a few different ways in the lab that we typically assess UR activation. And when we say activation, we, we typically mean cytoplasmic translocation. And so in cardiomyocytes, this happens in response to phenylephrine, which is a pro-hypertrophic stimulus. And you can see here, so we've stained the cells with wheat germ, wheat germ or gluten, so you can see cell size increases with phenylephrine, indicative of hypertrophy. 
And then the QR, which is the green stain here, predominantly in the nucleus upon basal conditions and uh, exported to the cytoplasm following that phenylephrine-induced stimulation. In cardiac fibroblasts, same thing. Here, the QR is the red stain. Uh, we treat the cells with TGF-beta, and you can see QR exit the nucleus into the cytoplasm, and that's concomitant with uh, the increase in alpha SMA expression indicative of myofibroblast activation. The other method that we use is just nuclear cytoplasmic uh, fractionation, looking at Western blotting of QR in the nucleus versus cytoplasm. And this over here, we can see that in brown adipocytes, QR becomes active downstream of, of the, this CL as a beta-3 specific agonist. So again, right, so many different activating stimuli, so phenylephrine, uh, these are alpha receptors, beta receptors, TGF-beta, so many different stimuli can activate QR in not only the same cells, but in different cells. So one of the very first findings that we that we had as a lab that kind of launched this whole QR project into cardiac biology is, is this slide here. So these are looking at QR staining in healthy donor hearts and, and failing human hearts. So these are LVAD cores. And you, you can notice two, two things relatively easily. One is that in the failing heart, the amount of QR staining is increased. So QR expression goes up. And the other thing is that if you take a look closer at where QR is in the cell, you can see that in the, in the failing cardiac uh, tissue, it's more predominant in the cytoplasm, indicative that it's also being activated in these failing hearts. So as part of Sam Sloan's PhD, what he showed um, was that QR was both necessary and sufficient for cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. So these are looking at um, NRVMs and NRVMs hypertrophy quite well. And so this is the, the image I showed before. QR becomes active in the hypertrophic myocytes. And if you, if you knock it down, um, the myocytes no longer hypertrophy. So so QR is, is necessary for that hypertrophy. And Sam also showed that if you treated them directly or overexpressed QR, it was sufficient to induce hypertrophic signaling. And, and so what this meant in vivo, so this was part of Lisa Green's PhD project. Um, what we wanted to know in vivo then was, well, if we inhibit QR in a pathological model of cardiac hypertrophy, can we see therapeutic benefit? And so here in this study, we took mice and we gave them an aortic constriction pressure overload, took them out to four weeks post-tac. And so you can see at four weeks, their LV ejection fraction has already decreased. And then we randomized them to either a vehicle or this KH3QR inhibitor drug. And so KH3 is a compound that basically competes away RNA binding of QR with its target. So it releases QR from the target RNA and inhibits its act act activity at that RNA target. And so when we did this at four weeks and we took the mice out another seven to 11 weeks total, you can see that the mice that got the KH3 treatment had it, it reduced that progression, that progressive decrease in LV ejection fraction. And also the hearts were smaller, so they were less hypertrophied. So, so indeed in a mouse model of pressure overload, there is therapeutic benefit. Uh, we can cure heart failure in a mouse uh, by giving them a QR inhibitor. And the other thing that we noticed is that at, at 11 weeks post-tac, the mice that got the QR inhibitor showed almost no interstitial fibrosis, um, which, and, and so we also showed a decrease in periostin and fibronectin. And this was curious to us because at the time, you know, we set this study up to, to ask the question of, we, we were looking um, specifically at cardiac hypertrophy. So we weren't really setting this up to see what was going on on the fibrosis directly. And, and so we do know that, you know, at four weeks post-tac, there probably was, according to other studies and, and things that we've done subsequently, there should have been fibrosis in these hearts. So, you know, kind of that burning question here was, well, did, did we potentially reduce fibrosis that was already there? Did we reverse remodel these hearts? And another thing that we looked at then at four weeks, we did a QR staining. So this is, this is a trichrome stain. So the blue is, is fibrosis. Uh, nickel DAB, so the dark stain is QR here, we saw that most of the QR in the myocardium co-localized with regions of fibrosis. So again, suggesting, okay, maybe, maybe there's something on the fibroblast side that's happening, right? So following this, we then wanted to know whether QR is playing a direct role in cardiac fibroblasts. And so we, we also switched models. So we went to an ischemia reperfusion model. And, and here we isolated protein from the non-ischemic region and the ischemic region and then just did a Western blot for periostin and QR. And you can see unsurprisingly, right, the periostin, the marker of the active myofibroblasts, is increased specifically in the ischemic region. 
And similarly, we also see an increase of HUR in the ischemic region. And so that, that's quantified here. And of course, the two, the two uh, they correlate really well. So, you know, HUR is enriched in the ischemic zone, mostly where the fibrosis is. Um, if we isolate cells and look at protein expression of HUR in the cardiomyocytes, the cardiac fibroblasts, and the myofibroblasts, um, we can see that there's an increase of HUR expression in the myofibroblasts. And then again, an image that I showed looking at activation of HUR, it is active in the myofibroblasts when they're expressing alpha SMA. And I also want to point out that as part of Lisa's in vivo work, we used the cardiomyocyte specific knockout of HUR and showed effect in that model. So we know there's protein expression in the myocytes, but when you put it on the same blot with, with fibroblast protein, there is so much more QR expression in the cardiac fibroblast that it kind of washes out uh, that signal from the myocytes. So thinking about cardiac fibroblasts and what they do in cardiac remodeling, right? So, I mean, they drive fibrosis, right? And they, they do this through a couple of different ways. So they mediate focal adhesion development. They, they actually give contractile support through that alpha SMA. They, they can migrate. And they obviously their their core folk their core role is the the matrix secretion of collagens, matricellular proteins like periostin, and that active remodeling and potentially reverse remodeling of of the cardiac ECM. So we wanted to get at some functional assays then to see whether QR is is doing this in cardiac fibroblasts. And so one of the first things that we did this was this was Lisa's recently published work. One of the first things we did was this scratch assay. So you take a plate of cells and you create this scratch wound down the middle, and then you see how quickly the, the fibroblast can migrate over and heal that scratch. And you can see in control cells, they, they do it pretty rapidly. If you knock down HUR with siRNA or give that inhibitory compound, they don't do it. And also we stain for alpha, alpha, sorry, alpha SMA, and you can see that the cells that are migrating over and closing up that scratch are positive for alpha SMA. And you see a lot of alpha SMA across the, the, the image. But in the cells that have gotten the HUR inhibitor, you see much less alpha SMA present. And then this is a, a quantified uh, scratch closures, closure. So you can see that the control cells close that scratch quite nicely, and you slow that process down when you either knock out or inhibit HUR. Another assay that we, that we use to look more directly at contractility properties of the fibroblast is this collagen gel contraction. And so you take this floating collagen gel, you plate primary fibroblasts into the gel, and then you treat it with TGF beta, and you can see the cells contract that collagen gel. Well, so, and if you do that in the presence of HUR inhibitor, um, that TGF beta mediated contractility is reduced, and that's, that's quantified down here. So this is showing that QR is necessary for the migratory function, but also the contractile function. So what about ECM production? Right, so here, this was this is looking at total collagen after the cells were decellularized. So we treated them with TGF beta. Um, we let them go for, I believe, three days to deposit collagen on the dish, and then we pulled the cells off and quantified collagen by picrosiris red. And you know, unsurprisingly, you treat them with TGF beta, their collagen deposition goes up. If you do that in the presence of HUR inhibitor, uh, you have a very significant reduction in collagen deposition. And the other thing we did is we, we did a full proteomics analysis on the decellularized ECM. And you can see that the, the proteome is quite different between the TGF beta treated and the TGF beta treated in presence of UR inhibitor. And if you look at just ECM proteins, you can see that there's, there's a, quite a difference in all of the, all the traditional ECM marker genes that you would look at are significantly reduced in the presence of the UR inhibitor. So, Lisa's work to summarize, she showed that, you know, these quiescent cardiac fibroblasts, when, when they uh, respond to a profibrotic stimulus and transition into a myofibroblast, that process is necessary, or QR is necessary for that process. So if you inhibit or knock down QR, um, you reduce the contractile function, the migration and the ECM production of these cells. So of course, you know, it's an RNA binding protein. It has a large number of targets. So what we really want to know is what is the mechanism for this? And so to do this with an RNA binding protein, the, the typical uh, thing that you do is you do a UV cross-linking. And we did this in the presence of 4SU, which just kind of enhances that cross-linking. And then you elute and sequence the bound RNAs and find out, you know, what, what are the targets of your RNA binding protein um, in, in the conditions you're looking at? So we're going to come back to that in a second, but before I move on to that, I just kind of want to summarize 
uh, halfway here of, of what we've shown. So, you know, Lisa and Sam together, their PhD projects basically showed that HUR expression and activity is increased in failing human hearts. Um, and HUR has independent functions in cardiomyocytes and fibroblasts. So I didn't really show much of the myocyte-centric data, but we do know that HUR mediates hypertrophy and cardiac myocytes. And then in fibroblasts, it, it mediates the activity of myofibroblasts via regulation of WISP-1, which I'll get into in a little bit here. And then um, I think we also showed that at least in the mouse model of TAC, pharmacological inhibition of HUR may be a viable therapeutic target. And that's when we did that at four weeks when pathology was already present, we were able to slow progression of the disease, not just inhibit the initiation of pathology. So looking at post-transcriptional mechanisms in cardiac fibroblasts, um, one thing we also did in, in trying to decipher what, what QR is doing in these cells is we went back to a data set generated by a friend and collaborator, owner Kanisacek, who I am excited to say is joining us here at Ohio State very soon. Um, he had published this data set of single cell RNA sequencing on 185 fibroblasts that were isolated at two weeks post MI. And so we just took the transcriptome of all these cells and ran a pretty simple co-expression analysis to ask, you know, what, what is being co-expressed with what? And we, we did this with regard to alpha SMA and periostin, which we know are markers of active myofibroblasts. And then we also looked to see what's being co-expressed with QR. And when we did this, one thing that was pretty striking is that the Venn diagram of, of the genes that co-express overlap quite well. So it's not surprising that the, the co-expressed genes with alpha SMA and periostin overlap, but also HUR. You can see that over half of the genes that co-express with HUR also have significant co-expression with alpha SMA and periostin. <laughs> and so a lot of the, if you look at the top HUR co-express genes, you'll notice that a lot of these are very traditional um, fibroblast, active myofibroblast markers. So we have that in hand. So now we wanted to combine that with that ParClip analysis to, to and that's going to tell us what genes, what RNA targets are directly bound by QR. And so when we did that RNA pull down and sequence QR target genes, we found 1,800 uh, direct QR targets in the quiescent inactive cardiac fibroblasts. And when we treated those cells with TGF beta, we found about two dozen that were that showed significantly enriched QR binding following TGF beta treatment. And then so we have our genes that co-express with alpha SMA, QR, and periostin. When we do, when we cross-reference those two data sets, we find 11 genes that show enriched QR binding following TGF beta treatment and significantly co-expressed with, with alpha SMA and periostin and QR in that data in that single cell data set. So zooming in on these 11 to see if we can find a downstream target of how QR might be mediating myofibroblast activation, what we saw, the very top gene in all of these was WISP1. And so WISP1 is CCN4, it shows homology to CTGF. And, and first, what we wanted to do is just, just kind of confirm that binding. So uh, this is showing that, that ParClip assay. So if we take the a QR antibody versus control antibody, we treat with TGF beta, you can see that binding increase. And in the presence of control antibody, that's not there. So that shows that we're specific. It's, it's a QR specific effect. And then looking at WISP1 RNA expression in the cells, you treat with TGF beta, it goes up. If you treat with TGF beta in the presence of QR inhibitor, it does not go up as much, suggesting or showing also that the, the WISP1 expression in these cells is indeed QR dependent. So like I said, WISP, WISP1, uh, the gene symbol is CCN4. It's a secreted matocellular protein that shows a lot. It's homologous to CTGF. Um, and um, so th there, there was, when we looked, there was a little bit of data out there in the literature suggesting that QR did play a role in these fibrotic processes. So um, one older paper from Colston et al. in 2007, they showed that WISP1 expression increases in the post-ischemic heart as early as one day and sustains out through seven days. And they also showed, they, they treated uh, isolated fibroblasts with recombinant WISP, and they showed that the, the cell proliferation and collagen synthesis of these cells was increased. Um, so, so definitely it looks like WISP has an effect on the fibroblast. It's doing something. It's potentially increasing their fibrotic activity, but they didn't really dig a whole lot deeper uh, as to what WISP was doing on the cardiac fibroblast beyond that. There have been a few subsequent studies. So Don Minnick's group showed that uh, 
WISP-1, again, they, they confirmed its increased post-myocardial infarction, and they showed that it regulates endothelial signaling. Uh, more on the fibrosis side, there was a 2022 paper in cell metabolism where they showed they were able to reduce fibrosis in a liver model uh, using a recombinant anti-WISP antibody. So one thing, you know, we're, we're really interested in what, what WISP is doing uh, mechanistically to these fibroblasts. And so this is a new, a new project by Sharon Parkins, PhD student in the lab. And so uh, what you're looking at here, so these are our primary uh, cardiac fibroblasts from mice. And Sharon just treated them with TGF beta and has stained for alpha SMA and vimentin. And of course, you do this and the alpha SMA stain increases post TGF beta treatment. If she treats these cells with recombinant WISP, you can also see that, that WISP also strongly induces alpha SMA in these cells. And very curiously, if you treat them with WISP and TGF beta in combination, it looks like this effect is potentially synergistic, but at least additive. So you can see it's pretty obvious that the, the amount of alpha SMA in these cells is, is really increased with both. So one, one thing that we're pursuing for the future now is how you know the signaling, the activation signaling of WISP-1, how it's similar and how it's different from uh, that of TGF beta. And then Sharon also did a scratch assay using WISP-1, and, and she showed that if you treat the cells with recombinant WISP, uh, it, it does speed up the rate at which these cells uh, recover that scratch. And the other thing is, you know, so we showed this as being downstream of QR, so looking at contractility. So this is back to those collagen gel contraction assays. So if you treat the cells with TGF-beta, um, you know, they'll increase gel contraction that's, that's QR dependent in that if you, if you inhibit QR, it reduces that. So we, we did that, and then we added recombinant WISP on top of that and showed that the recombinant WISP is able to rescue that, suggesting that the WISP-1 is indeed downstream of QR in this myofibroblast contractility assay. And if you treat the cells with recombinant WISP and QR inhibitor concomitantly, um, the QR inhibitor doesn't actually do anything to the amount, to the, to the contractile response of, of WISP-1. So as part of Sharon's project and, and this whole QR WISP signaling axis, what we're also really interested in is whether or not we can take this cardiac, this myofibroblast phenotype and, and get reversion of this phenotype, right? So these cells are activated to mature myofibroblasts, but can they be deactivated and induce reverse remodeling of this cardiac ECM? Oops, that's, that's the wrong order. So we showed that you know, if you inhibit QR or if you inhibit WISP-1, you can reduce this activation of fibroblast to mature myofibroblast. But what, what we wanna dive into next is what if you inhibit QR or WISP-1 at, at the state of mature myofibroblast, can you actually get these cells to turn off and reverse remodel? And so uh, some newer data that Sharon has. So, what, so in, in getting at this, what we did is we took cells and we treated these, these are again, isolated cardiac fibroblasts from mouse heart. And we treated them with TGF beta. <clears throat> and you can see at two days post TGF beta treatment that both periosin expression goes up, suggesting again, confirming that myofibroblast phenotype and WISP1 RNA expression goes up. And then we either took, we either added more TGF or left or took TGF off. And, and we did that just to confirm that the removal of TGF itself wasn't going wasn't gonna to turn these cells off, which you know, we didn't expect it to, and it didn't. So then we, took the, we did the same thing, TGF on or TGF off, in the presence of HUR inhibitor to ask, does, does HUR turn these genes off in a mature myofibroblast? And so on the periostin side, it, it does not. So if you, if you inhibit HUR, periostin stays up in either case. But if you inhibit QR and look at WISP-1 expression, WISP-1 comes back down to baseline. So we're not quite sure what this means functionally just yet, but what it does mean is that when we inhibit QR in a mature myofibroblast, we are changing the transcriptome of that cell at a couple of days later. Now, what we don't know, we haven't got to the experiment yet where we inhibit WISP-1 in these cells. Um, so in, in both cases, right, I think the key question is what's happening, happening functionally, uh, which is certainly on our radar for future work. So the working model that we have right now is that, you know, a fibroblast responds to TGF beta with this profibrotic signaling, part of which is the activation of QR and the upregulation of WISP-1, CCN4. QR binds to WISP-1 RNA and induces its, its expression. And we know WISP-1 is a secreted matrix cellular protein. 
Um, what we don't know then is how WISP-1 is acting back on the cell and mediating this additive or synergistic activation. So this, this signaling pathway here is still pretty much a black box for us. Um, but again, the, the key question, right, is, is what, what's that signaling pathway doing, not only in this progression from, um, from fibroblast to myofibroblast, but what is it doing in the maintenance of this mature myofibroblast state? So that's kind of where I want to leave off today. I think that that was about the right amount of time. So again, new picture of our lab showing us outside our the, the new Pelotonia Research Center here at OSU. Um, and the uh, thanks to the people that did a lot of the work. So Sarah, Adrian, Sharon, and Pooja consist, uh, make up the lab now. Uh, I think it was pretty obvious that Sam and Lisa did a lot of that. So thanks to all of them, our funding, our collaborators. And I suppose I will hold questions until the end. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Thank you, Mike. That was a great talk. Um, so everybody can put um, their questions in the chat box and we'll just get to them at the end so you don't forget them. So if you do have questions, you can feel free to type them in while we um, set up for Lei Ming's talk. Okay. So Lei Ming, you can share your slides. Um, so our next speaker, Dr. Li Ming Pei is an associate professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, his lab focuses on the molecular mechanisms that underlie cardiac disease pathogenesis um, with a particular focus on metabolic remodeling and interorgan crosstalk. And today he's going to be talking about uh, a single cell multiomics guided approach to understanding liver disease. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica, for a very kind introduction. Uh, it's really a great pleasure uh, of, of mine uh, to be here uh, to um, present some of our work. Um, um, so um, the talk, uh, uh, the topic of my uh, talk is, uh, is I make the title slightly different, so basically trying to understand heart disease, put in a bigger picture um, in the context of heart disease, uh, is metabolic complications with, uh, arising from heart disease. Uh, so again, um, as Jessica said, I'm at uh, uh, Ch Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and University of Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, for many of you who are not very familiar with our uh, research, I just want to have one slide to, to tell you a little bit more on the bigger picture, uh, what do we do? So uh, we're taking um, a broad approach from a broad a spectrum of study, but with a focus on heart disease and heart disease related um, complications. So uh, we often start from some genomics or phenotypic studies. Um, I will illustrate a little bit more. And we go to understand its biology and understand its mechanism. We also do um, up to preclinical um, diagnostic and some um, uh, therapeutic uh, testing uh, at the preclinical uh, level. Um, in more details, we often uh, start with some genomics and genetic study with a major focus on the heart, but also look at some complications, uh, including liver and kidney. Uh, we apply a, a lot of, we do a lot of single cell omics ourselves and also, the, uh, also mine um, uh, the, all the published data um, to uh, look at specific uh, questions. Um, from there, we do our own data analysis and data validation. And then from those data, we generate a hypothesis. Uh, and then next, we use animal models and human iPS cell derived models to, uh, to test our hypothesis and to try to understand uh, underlying mechanism. And we also do a little bit uh, in um, uh, working in the Department of Pathology to working with our clinical colleagues. Uh, it happens some of the research that we're doing turns out to be important clinically. Um, that so we're developing uh, clinical diagnostic uh, for the patients, as well as some uh, gene therapy uh, studies to, to try to really help the patients that uh, we, uh, we work together with. Uh, so for today, uh, I'm going to tell you one story. Uh, this is based on the uh, complication and organ complication derived from a heart disease. Um, Mike has just gave a very nice introduction, so I just want to also have just one slide here. Uh, so there is a very close relationship between heart disease and other metabolic disease, for example, diabetes. Um, there's a lot of different uh, cross-organ um, uh, organ uh, crosstalks. Uh, I just there's just too so much um, um, you know uh, clinical results there. I just want to point out a few of the recent uh, from a few recent reviews. Um, for example, um, they are both independent risk factors for each other. 
uh, typically having one wall result in two to fold higher risk for the other uh, disease. Uh, about one third of type 2 diabetes patients uh, have cardiovascular disease, and about 30% with coronary heart disease also have diabetes. In fact, also, one, also we are studying heart disease, but if you look at everything, angiotensin and those uh, blood pressure control drugs coming along many years ago, the most in the last uh, decades, the most important and effective uh, drugs uh, treating heart disease, uh, in fact, two of them, one is SGL22 inhibitors, one is GLP-1 um, um, activist, uh, uh, agonist, both of them, uh, in fact, uh, first derived as uh, diabetes drugs and turned out to also have huge benefit uh, on, to treat heart disease, far better than anything uh, that's uh, specifically designed to uh, fight uh, heart disease. Uh, so for today's talk, I'm just going to illustrate our research on one with one story, uh, uh, which is unpublished. Um, so this is regarding um, trying to uh, understand a, a disease. In fact, it's, I will explain it's a new disease. Um, I will explain why it's new uh, later. It's called Fontaine associated liver disease. I want to first have a shout out to uh, the people who really worked uh, on this project, um, leads the project. Uh, one is Paul Hu, who used to be a research assistant in the lab and now a, a grad student at, at Penn. And Juan Juan Zhao, who, is, who uh, was a postdoc in the lab and now uh, working as a director in a biotech. Uh, and Dr. Jack Reichick, who is our uh, who is a um, cardiologist here at SHOP. Um, who really uh, brought me to this uh, field and alerted me to the big challenges that these patients uh, are facing. So we're talking about uh, Fontaine and Fontaine associated liver disease. For those of you who are not familiar with, in fact, I myself have no idea about this five years ago. Um, so basically this is so-called Fontaine invented by a, a surgeon uh, with the last name Fontaine, of course, uh, so basically, it's a life-saving surgical technique, and it's also the current standard of care for children with a very severe form of congenital heart disease, so-called single ventricle congenital heart disease. This happens about two to three infants uh, per about 10,000 live births in the United States, uh, as there are uh, reported about close to 100,000 in Europe and uh, US or North America combined uh, such patients at this point. Uh, the genetic causes of most of those patients are unknown, just like many other congenital heart disease. Typically, more than 50% of genetic causes, we, we have no idea. Some of them we know, but there's a lot of different uh, mutations, I believe, to, to contribute to this, um, from, uh, to this single ventricle congenital heart disease. Uh, so um, um, about up to about 15 years or 20 years ago, these kids would 100% die because they were born only with one ventricle. We all know our heart needs two ventricles. One was supplied to the whole body, one was supplied the blood to the, to the lung. Uh, however, with the invention of this Fontaine uh, surgery, um, the survival rate now gradually um, uh, uh, climbed, uh, reaching about 80% uh, very recently. So. Just to explain to you uh, what this surgery does is uh, please see the cartoon here. Uh, this is a very simplified version. Uh, the real uh, uh, surgery is much, much more complicated. But in this case, for example, shown here, this is a kid born with a normal right ventricle, but uh, has an atrophy uh, left ventricle. So this left ventricle is not going to enough to be pumping blood to uh, the whole body. And this kid would have died right after birth. What the surgery does eventually is trying to use whatever the remaining functional ventricle, like this right ventricle, as the de facto um, left ventricle. So now you see they connect, reroute the, the circulation to connect the aorta to the right ventricle. So this functional ventricle can pump blood to the whole body. It's strong enough. Now the problem is you don't have another normal right ventricle to pump blood to the lung. So what you do is reroute um, the the vein part, the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava is, again, this is a simplified model to directly connect those um, uh, veins, which used to be uh, in the normal heart to go back to the right atrium, right ventricle, then go to, to the lung. Now it's directly connect them to the lung. So we here is a passive flowing of the blood without support of the right ventricle. 
So it sounds simple uh, from this cartoon, but it's really serious surgery. It's typically uh, involves at least uh, about three steps. The first step will be have have to be within a couple of days, few days after birth, and then another surgery uh, around six months of age, and another surgery, a final surgery, at about uh, two to three years of age. Um, so, but it's really a, a game changer. It's now. Um, um, uh, as I mentioned, about uh, more than 80% of survival um, to adulthood. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, what I mentioned earlier about uh, close to 100,000, those are the currently surviving uh, patients. Um, however, uh, when these kids grow up, um, we thought we solved the problem. It's the heart is still not fully functional, but they survive well. Uh, however, when they grow up, we realized that there is some serious complications from this uh, surgery. Uh, first reported, I believe, about uh, 2005, um, um, uh, but is the uh, is this thing uh, a very severe uh, liver complications, which in fact is the most uh, uh, devastating and um, universal complications reside uh, arising from this. Uh, fountain operation. So this is typically now called fountain associated liver disease. So this is very severe and life-threatening uh, hepatic fibrosis. Um, there's absolutely no treatments. Again, um, as I mentioned, this is a new disease. Uh, they often leads to liver cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma and may require liver transplant at a very young age, like 20 years of age. Um, so almost 100% of the fountain patients develop FALD. So this is really interesting uh, because uh, it's so universal because the original genetic causes of the uh, of the original single ventricle heart disease, there are just so many uh, with, and many of them unknown as I explained. So with so diverse genetic causes and all of them, no matter boys or girls all develop this strongly suggests this is not um, caused by the genetics or specific mutation, because there could be hundreds of them of the heart disease, but more probably from the, the surgery, the fountain surgery. Um, they're also morphologically and mechanistically distinct from other liver fibrotic disease, for example, alcoholic liver disease or NASH, uh, or now called MASH, uh, basically non-alcoholic or metabolic associated uh, uh, steatosis and hepato, um, hepatitis and cirrhosis, basically very different from the other. Again, uh, their passive physiology and mechanism is not understood. Uh, in the end, this is a new disease. Uh, 20 years ago, these kids would have died. There's no uh, this liver disease existing. Now, only because of the success of the fountain surgery, these kids survive. Um, they start to develop this disease uh, very early on from about a teenager. So we really uh, want to help um, this uh, these kids um, live a much more um, normal life uh, and without this disease. So um, so we're in, in um, engaging a, a lot of effort here with a lot of collaborators. Uh, but I, what I want to share with you is some of the work we did first, which is trying to gain a basic understanding of what is happening in this kid's liver. What is really um, it's happening, what has the potential pathogenesis mechanism. So for that, we used a single cell uh, omics, just trying to get a basic understanding. So in this, for this specific initial study, we did, uh, as shown here, um, liver biopsies from four Fontan patients. They have different type of um, single ventricle morphology. So these are their uh, basic, uh, some of the clinical data. I want to point out to you a few of them. Uh, they all have this, uh, have their fountain done at the same age and uh, around uh, 30 months of age, have their liver biopsy done all as a teenager between 13 and 18 years of age. Um, uh, one thing I want to point to you, uh, which will turns out to be uh, important is um, this so-called IVC pressure um, and also hepatic vein uh, pressure. So these are, you can see about between two, uh, between 10 and uh, 15 uh, millimeter uh, mercury. Uh, in our normal um, uh, uh, people in you and me, um, this level should be between um, zero and five uh, millimeter um, mercury because there should be very little pressure there. The reason we have a right ventricle to pump that to the lung. So we, so before the heart, uh, right ventricle, the pressure is really low. And th in these patients, um, uh, because there's, there's a lack of right ventricle as a pump, so the pressure has to be high enough to allow the blood to flow to the next organ, which is the lung, which typically have a pressure around 20 millimeter uh, mercury. 
Um, so this is a known clinical feature, but it turns out uh, when we look at the, the results, uh, it's, it's become uh, important, uh, we believe, uh, important pathogenic um, cause. Uh, as a control, we have um, two um, uh, liver samples from uh, two also two teenagers. Um, so um, just for many of you who uh, spend many years studying uh, one of the most important, uh, which is the heart, um, I just want to share with you a little bit about liver biology 101. Um, this is typical liver histology that you will see. Uh, they are organized in a specific way, but you probably will see it, understand a little bit better in a cartoon here. So liver uh, structure uh, and it's modular. So basically, it's, uh, the blood flows from, uh, shown here from the left to the right, is a kind of hexagonal structure. On one side, you have three kind of vessels. The portal vein, which is the vein that brings the blood from the intestine, um, and hepatic artery. Uh, and also, of course, uniquely, you have a bile duct to generate bile, bile that is important for digestive food. Um, and on the right side, the blood flows in. Uh, we're all going into so-called central vein, and that's a vein, and that comes out, and then uh, join the IVC and go back to the lung. Uh, so there are multiple different cell types uh, in the liver. Uh, most abundant is hepatocyte. Uh, interesting thing is you can just tell uh, whether the hepatocyte is close to the central part, central vein, or close to the portal vein uh, by their gene expression. The reason is the portal vein will bring a huge amount of nutrients from the intestine. That's where the digested nutrients come in. So the portal hepatocytes will express a lot of genes, uh, a high abundance of genes uh, involved in lipid metabolism and sugar metabolism and others, uh, in contrast to the central hepatocytes. So besides the hepatocytes, you have cytes, which basically line the bile duct. You have uh, immune cells, including lymphocytes and macrophages. You have a huge amount of endothelial cells. Uh, and they also have a specific cells called hepatic stellar cells. It's a star-like shaped cells, uh, which is basically the fibroblast uh, in the liver. So, so this is the basic liver. And then the next several slides will just uh, share with you some of the key uh, results that we, we see. Um, so the, what you're looking at here is about 10,000 cells of nuclear from um, uh, the uh, con to control uh, patient. So this is uh, uh, the study is a uh, single nucleus RNA ATAC seq, uh, which with both the RNA and ATAC data coming from the same cell. So that allow you to infer some causal relationship of the regulatory mechanism. So if you just look at the transcriptomic data alone, so this is what you see. As I mentioned, you see clearly all seven cell types. The majority of them are central and portal hepatocytes. You see lymphocytes, macrophages, you see HSC, you see um, uh, endothelial cells, and you see cytes. Uh, so now, if you look at the fontan liver, you look at basically the same thing. Uh, there are about 14, uh, 16,000 uh, nuclei from four um, livers here. Um, so again, you see the same seven cell types. There's no cell uh, types that's lost. There's also um, uh, no new cell types. I, for I forgot one thing uh, from the earlier slide is that we choose um, specifically those biopsy samples from teenagers uh, because at this age, um, they are also at kind of the early stage of the, uh, of the liver disease. Uh, we choose this age and early stage because we want to understand potentially causal uh, mechanism and, um, of the disease rather than at a later stage, um, uh, the, all the different complications and secondary uh, effect. Uh, with this teenager or early stage, uh, clinically, all you much must uh, all you see is a very mild starting about fibrosis, uh, but very little uh, histological under microscope uh, some other changes. Uh, so now going back to this data, this clearly see at this early stage there's no huge change of cell type composition, but what's changing is the gene expression of every cell type uh, is is undergoing some changes. So this slide shows. Um, if you look at individual cell type, all seven cell types, what's the down-regulated genes um, uh, in red and up-regulated genes? Uh, so it listed all the different number of genes and their um, uh, statistically uh, significance. As I mentioned, at this early stage under microscope, all you can see is very mild fibrosis. So what we expected in the before we see the result is we, we expect that we'll see a significant changes in hepatic cellular cells, which are again the fibroblasts, but 
it's a little bit to our surprise that that's not what we see, what the change is happening. Uh, at HSC, we do see some changes, but it's not uh, dramatic. We only see about 200 uh, genes. And it turns out what's the biggest change is happening, about 50% of changes happening in one cell type, in the central hepatocytes. Uh, so another interesting thing, the changes only happening in central hepatocytes, but not in the other hepatocyte population, the portal hepatocyte. So there's definitely a disconnection between the hepatocyte's behavior on the central side versus uh, the, the portal side. Uh, and you can also see from the their p value, there's a huge difference uh, of changes in the central hepatocyte versus all the other um, uh, cell types. If you look at what those exactly changes are across all those, uh, many of them don't follow up a certain pattern. Um, the only two areas that follow a specific pattern, that is hepatic theta cells, all the upper regulatory genes are related to um, a fibrosis, uh, extracellular matrix, of course, or in response to GF beta. Another, only other uh, that um, show a specific pattern, that's the central hepatocytes, the upper regulatory genes. And in fact, another, uh, a little bit to our surprise, because we're specifically looking at liver fibrotic disease, and turns out the biggest changes in those uh, central hepatocytes are metabolic change, mostly dominated by metabolic change, especially small molecule metabolism that you uh, like xenobiotic response uh, to remove the and, and hormone response uh, oxidation. Basically, all the pathways that modulate uh, small molecules. So this is really, uh, as I mentioned, a surprise to us, but we're really also um, interesting because it points out that we're looking at this early stage of the font uh, fontan liver disease. Um, and it turns out that the hepatic uh, stellar cells, the fibroblasts, are probably not the primary um, um, initiator of the response, it turns out it's very likely that the central hepatocytes is the first responder in the pathogenesis of this disease, and then it somehow activate, further activates the hepatic stellar cells and to promote a fibrosis. Uh, we can, again, also look at epigenomic landscape. Um, these are from uh, the uh, ATAC data from the same cell. Um, as you can, again, um, you can see just based on ATAC data alone or a joint uh, multi ohm data, you can see all seven cell types, both in the control livers and fontan livers. If you look at now using a very high um, stringent um, threshold, what are the newly opened chromatin area, uh, which is green or completely closed chromatin area, which is red. This summarizes all those changes at the uh, epigenetic level in all seven cell types. Again, you see about 50% of change are all happening in one cell type. That's the central hepatocytes. If you look at what those newly opened or, um, or newly opened, those green um, chromatin regions are, they are all centered on genes important in small molecule uh, metabolism. Very, it's, it's almost the same as what you see from the gene expression data. So um, the, the fact that you have the RNA gene expression, the ATAC data from the same cell that really allow you to um, unbiasedly to uh, explore or, or understand the regulatory mechanism of those gene expression changes. For example, we use it to understand what causes um, the metabolic changes in the central hepatocytes. And for this, I just show you an example. Uh, one of the genes, for example, this gene uh, alcoholic dehydrogenase that uh, metabolizes a small molecule alcohol. Um, uh, this is all the um, ATAC peaks that you see. Um, this is gene uh, structure. And from the ATAC peaks, you can extract potential uh, binding uh, or open chromatin regions are here. Now the key question is, which of those regions are really important? So this is can be done with at a single cell level because every single cell you have either a chromatin uh, is in all those uh, peaks either open or closed. And you can also look at the same cell, whether the gene is highly expressed or low expressed, as well as whether the promoter is open or closed. So you can look at every single cell. Now you have thousands of cells. So you can look at those thousands of central hepatocytes to compare which of those ATAC peaks really positively or negatively correlate with the promoter peaks and gene expression. Uh, so with that, you can really tell which of those peaks are really important um, 
uh, for the expression of specific genes such as ADF4. In fact, from this analysis, it turns out the downstream a downstream enhancer region is a critical, most critical region rather than the other regions uh, to that influence ADH4 expression. Now that's just one gene and you can do that across all the genes, those hundreds of genes that is upregulated in central hepatocytes. And now you can see, get those all the different enhancer peaks and then you can find common uh, regulatory regions and sequences and to ex explore what has the potential transcriptional regulators. And in this case, it turns out these are the top transcription factors that probably uh, regulates the central hepatocytes metabolic gene uh, expression changes, including both some of the known ones like PBR gamma and alpha and RF1 that has been known to regulate liver metabolism, as well as some new ones that um, we know are very or, or nothing, almost nothing about what's how whether they're important for liver function or liver metabolism. So to further look at that, that type of work is ongoing. And the last thing I want to data part I want to share is, uh, as I mentioned, um, the data suggests that. In fact, it is a fibrotic disease, but it may be initiated from central hepatocytes. So we really start to looking at how that changes in central hepatocytes results in the activation of uh, fibroblasts and fibrosis. For this, we, we, we conducted a, a, a standard assay, so-called ligand receptor pairing, basically like, like to see basically what are the uh, either secreted or cell surface ligands that are increased in central hepatocytes in the Fontan patients, and what are their what are the receptors that are increased in the Fontan patients, but in the hepatic stellar cells. So if they're both increased, they're most likely there's a ligand signaling from the central hepatocytes to the uh, HSC to promote uh, fibrosis. And we identified about uh, 118 such uh, ligand and receptor pairs with a ligand on the central hepatocytes and receptor on the HSC. Uh, and they are uh, induced in Fontan patients. And this sh table shows the top 15. Um, this happened to be dominated by all the uh, TGF beta family members. The so TGF beta itself is very little expressed in the Fontan uh, livers. Um, so these are the other TGF7 inhibiting. Uh, a, B, C, and E, they are the other TGF beta family members that is highly expressed. So one of the things we did is some experimental validation. So this is done in human fibroblasts that we treat cells with some of the, the top candidates. Uh, so the gene is called inhibiting. Uh, the protein that they made is as a homodimer is in fact called activing, which is a normal clan uh, Clitture changes. Uh, so in this experiment, we treat the human fibroblasts with increasing doses of uh, the top candidates that we see the activin A, activin B, activin C, and using TGF beta um, as a positive control. As uh, you can see, uh, in a dose dependent manner, activin A and B um, uh, activates the uh, expression of typical uh, fibrotic genes such as uh, alpha smooth muscle actin or collagens, uh, but activin C uh, doesn't. Uh, and this also happens at a protein level. You can see a strong induction of protein level of smooth muscle actin by activin A and B, of course, with TGF beta, but not by uh, very little by activin C. So to summarize what we have found so far, again, I, I want to emphasize this is the first step, just trying to un understand the basic pathogenesis mechanism of the disease so we can identify the target and develop models and trying to um, really find therapy uh, for these uh, patients. Uh, so what we found is using um, human liver biopsies of uh, applying a single cell omics approach to gain a basic understanding. So what we believe is a, the key pathogenesis mechanism is uh, started uh, from the central hepatocytes and going back is most likely probably due to the elevated pressure um, uh, of the central vein, which is a key uh, clinical feature of these patients that uh, directly, probably through either mechanical stress or some other mechanism that directly affecting the hepatocytes, but only on the close to the central vein. And these are uh, mostly metabolic gene expression changes, and then it's mediated by the uh, some of the transcription factors that we described. Uh, the biggest change are small molecule uh, metabolism, xenobiotic response, cellular oxidoreductase um, um, activities. So in addition to that, the central hepatocytes also elevate expression of a lot of different ligands, for example, activins, that can um, uh, activate um, 
um, the talk to the hepatic status cell and activism and then uh, promote fibrosis and result into the uh, result in the clinical uh, phenotype that we see. And hopefully we can target some of the um, uh, key signals here, uh, trying to see whether we can help these uh, patients. And with that, I want to acknowledge all the people. I um, show some of the pictures of the key people, but here and in the blue uh, are the lab members, Paul, Hua Jing, and Aiden, and alumni, Jian Jian, and our clinical collaborator, Jack and Ben, uh, which are, are really uh, essential for, for this um, studies and all our um, lab members, lab alumni, and our collaborators for uh, all the other work that we do together and really uh, appreciate the support from NIH, from um, NIH Hub Map Project, from the Department of Defense, American Heart Association, um, CHOP, uh, and also additional ventures, especially additional ventures. Um, in fact, CHOP's Florida Award funded our um, initial uh, pilot study and additional ventures um, funded our uh, continuing study. So we really appreciate that, uh, on, on them uh, that allow us to look at this um, uh, important clinical question. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Ling. Um, okay, so I guess we'll start taking questions. So if you can please put your questions into the Q&A box. And while you're doing that, I guess we could start with questions. Um, okay, I guess I'll start, um, I guess we'll go backwards. I'll start with um, Li Meng. Um, I was just wondering, I was wondering if the, um, in these patients with fun hands, um, if they have increased sympathetic stress, and if you think that that's the initial factor that's driving the change in, um, in the pressure that may be causing the hepatocyte effect, is that the ultimate driving stimulus, you think? That's a good question. I in fact, don't know the exact answer. Uh, I don't think it is a sympathetic uh, tone drive. It's probably mostly an adaptive response from these patients because they, they're lacking a right ventricle. The blood pressure has to be a little bit higher. There's a little bit lymphatic congestion on mm -hmm. upstream of the sand. So that's probably, at least clinically, that believes the cause. But I don't know whether clinical data shows they have a higher a sympathetic tone um, that is causing that, uh, that I don't know of. Yeah. Okay. And then in those transcription factors that you identified in your ATAC seek, um, are those changed? Do you have you check to see if their expression are changed in the in the hepatocytes? Yes. So uh sorry I due to time I didn't share data. So our criteria of uh, what's up what's those transcription factors is not just they are have enriched motif, but also their expression is upregulated, at least in the central hepatocytes. So so they are, yeah. Okay. And then are there any, did you identify any chromatin modifiers that may be mediating your um, effects in the ATAC seek in your data sets? Now, that's another very good question. We uh, the, the approach that we took uh, couldn't allow us to do that because we're looking at sequence motifs. We mm -hmm. have the sequence of the enhancers, so we look at transcription factor binding motifs. Okay. So that approach don't uh, allow us, but what we did- But your RNA-seq might. Your yes. RNA -seq might. <laughs> Just look at all the chromatin modifying enzymes or SY SNF complexes. What, uh, what any of them uh, have their expression induced? So that's the way we look at, uh, not through ATAC data, but from RNA data. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, and then I guess my other um, question that I think I was thinking of was like, how has anybody characterized um, so like hepatocyte loss throughout? the progression like i know you're looking at teens but like as as the disease progresses is there just like a rampant amount of hepatocyte loss that's taking place uh that's another good question my understanding i, I haven't heard of anything about hepatocyte loss but there's a huge transformation they become a cirrhosis cirrhotic and then further develop into a liver cancer the hepatocellular carcinoma so that's in fact killing these patients um the heart disease are uh, after surgery the heart disease becomes somehow a less clinical problem. The, the This complication becomes the problem that kills these uh, patients or, or become life-threatening. And they often need a liver transplant very soon, yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, are there animal models of this? I know the surgery is probably not so easy, but like of the original congenital defects? That's the most difficult part. Now, I would say um, now, there are people, uh, so the short answer is there's no proven uh, clinical models for not only Fontan, but also the Fontan liver disease. Uh, mm -hmm. But now people are developing, uh, there's a couple of groups having uh, developing just doing the same Fontan surgery 
of course, probably not in a baby mouse, but in lamb and pig, that they have, um, of course, um, with some heart specific surgery. But it turns out what I heard of uh, by talking with people is they develop liver disease. Now, how closely at molecular and phenotypic level they resemble the human disease, that's an area we're trying to work together to, to, to do that. And also now from our study and others, it turns out the central venous hypertension is a key feature. Maybe we man manipulate that, but that right. will potentially yeah. cause some. So that's yeah. another approach that we're taking. Very nice. Cool. Great. Thanks, Lin Ming. Does anybody else have questions? I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Mark, I don't know if you, I can start asking Mike some questions. Anybody we have one at, at oh, the chat. Oh, there is one. Okay. Oh, um, okay. I noticed that in the TSNE of healthy versus Fontan, the population of Leonard say in HS C's increased. Are there any known complications in patients when it comes to bile acids? Are these cells also susceptible to the mechanical stress from overpressure? Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, that's a very um, interesting uh, point that you already noticed and is, is important. Um, I have to say our sample number is small, as I mentioned, two and four. Uh, one of the reasons, as you can see, uh, to get those clinical uh, as part of a clinical program, it's, it's not that easy with that same age. Um, but um, from the small numbers, we don't have uh, statistical significance uh, regarding whether the cholangiocytes or HSC percentage uh, are increased. Now, regarding bile acids, that's a very nice, uh, important question. Um, I don't know the answer uh, to that. Um, uh, I haven't heard that from clinicians that is a kind of a problem that jumps out uh, that you see. So I assume it's probably even there's a sporadic. The last question, um, we are thinking that, um, that this will be likely... Um, uh, some mechanical stress could be a potential um, driving feature of the hepatocytes changes. Maybe I can have a question to ask Mike um, uh, for the QR. Um, uh, what, so what do you see, um, how you tell the, the difference between the um, uh, cardiomyocytes versus um, uh, uh, the fibroblasts um, individually um, regarding their contributions in the general disease? Uh, to the like final fibrosis because I believe in both they could contribute but is there a way that you can tell which one is more important uh, because if you knock out both probably both have a phenotype but in a normal disease which one is more important that contributes the most yeah that's a great question and that's a really hard question to address right I mean so when when we started down this road we used a, a myocyte specific knockout so that was pretty easy right to isolate what's happening in the myocytes and then we used the the inhibitor drug and of course, that's that's inhibiting QR everywhere. So that yeah. that makes it right very hard to tell what cell types are contributing. So we do have uh, both quiescent and active myofibroblast CRE models in the lab where we're knocking out QR specifically in those cell populations. So that should be able to help us a little bit. But but there's always still that cell to cell crosstalk, right? Where you're you're affecting myocytes by what the fibroblasts are secreting and vice versa. So, you know, we, we haven't applied single cell RNA-seq in these models yet, and we're looking to probably do that with the inhibitor, uh, using teaming up with, with owner Kanistacek, doing some lineage tracing to figure out, you know, how cells are, are changing both phenotypically and transcriptomically. So that's probably our best bet. I don't know if there's ever going to be a perfect way to do that, though. Um, I have some questions too, I guess. Um, so fall, kind of following up on that in the cardiomyocytes specifically, do different stresses mediate different QR targets? Like, so you're showing, always showing an increase in expression and activity, but is there something mechanistically within the cell that specific stresses cause it to target specific things and what might mediate that? Like under a hypertrophic stress versus an ischemic stress? Yeah, that's, a, that's, about that? that's also, that's also a really great question. Um, and I, we don't know is a short answer, but I would say probably. And I think that is, so, you know, we, we've, we've looked at it in a couple of different models and it looks like, you know, the, the end effect is that if you block it, things are better. Mm -hmm. uh, but the ways that that's working, the mechanisms look to be a little different. So I would say probably, right. And I think that's something that again, like we, you know, we have not done the the RNA pull down and transcriptomic profiling in all of these models and all the cell types. And it's something that, you know, now that we're at OSU and we've got 
you know, resources to pursue all these ideas. I think it's definitely something that we want to do. Uh, Cause yeah, that's, you know, big, big questions there. Yeah. And then a follow-up to that, like, have you, does it, does its activity or expression levels change in response to physiological stimuli in any condition? Uh, we've had the idea to look for a long time. Uh, we, we just have never actually done it. Okay. Yeah. Cause I would assume like, you know, I don't know what transcriptionally regulates you are, but if they're, you know, if it's like, I mean, obviously probably like things like physiological hypertrophy and stuff, but I'm thinking like just even it's expression in response to other just general everyday signaling. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I, I will say on that front, the one, I guess the closest thing we've done is we have overexpressed UR in the myocytes. And the, if I recall correctly, it, we did see pathogenic markers go up. Okay. So it would suggest that it's primarily a, a pathological response, but I, I can't say for certain of that right now. Well, I guess another thing that I guess could start to get at that is you don't, in your um, systemic treatment, you don't see any phenotype in any other organs either, right? Like, so in independent of your cardiac stress, uh, we don't. Yeah. So we, we gave the inhibitor for seven weeks. Now we didn't, we didn't do like a full extensive autopsy, but we mm -hmm. didn't see anything uh, that immediately stood out, which is interesting because we also, we know that it's got a, it has a prominent role in adipose tissue as well. And it's pretty ubiquitously expressed. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah. yeah, but no, nothing super obvious with seven weeks. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Um, does anybody else that's on the the line have any questions? You can put them in the chat. Mark, I don't know if you have anything. I don't know. They're yeah, they're both really interesting topics. Yeah, very, um, very good thought. Um, yeah. I don't have any specific questions, but yeah, very, very interesting to see both stories and, and uh, be excited to see how things go moving forward. Yeah, Do thanks you... again for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. so um Thank you, uh, Li Ming and Mike, for presenting today. Thank you, Jessica, for moderating the session. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing how the seminar series moves forward into the new year. Uh, so for anyone in the audience, um, please reach out if you're interested in joining the committee or if you're interested in presenting. Um, thank you all for your attention today. Again, very wonderful seminars. And um, oh, we do, oh, have, I we do have one final question. <laughs> um, Throw Heinrich, thank you. So, simple question to both speakers when hypertrophy comes into play, is it reversible? Yes, yes, and no, right? I mean, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's been shown that you look at patients that have gotten an LVAD, right? The the myocyte hypertrophy does revert back. Um, but I don't, I don't know that it's understood on the molecular level yet whether that decrease in hypertrophy that you see is really, you know, what's still going on in those cells. And same same thing for fibroblasts, right? If we're looking to revert them, what's what's still going on? Do they retain some kind of a memory there? There's there's often so-called physiological versus pathological hypertrophy, right? So physiological if you and athletes or, or um like have a hypertrophy heart, but that's that's great. Some some people stop exercising and the heart goes back. So let me, in your, like, kind of though, I guess, along the lines of this question in your models, when patients undergo transplant, um, does that correct the metabolic? I mean, I guess it, if the, the liver disease isn't that, that advanced, does that correct or prevent the liver disease from taking place? That's a very good question. I want to know the answer too, but uh, there's so far, there's no clinical data. Again, this is relatively new disease and uh, these patients, are, many of them are after the transplant and then shortly afterwards should be whatever the transplant in liver whether was conditioned but then i imagine that over the years they will be influenced again by that uh, pressure um uh hypertension venous central venous hypertension uh will be affected again so but that remains to be seen uh we, we so far there's no clinical data on that yeah or the cardiac transplant yeah. yeah, so so that's another way, of course, to correct this ch right. children's heart is that's, to do yeah. the heart transplant. Uh, that's also a little bit challenging uh, to have a to you you have to have a baby's heart to give you to for transplant because right. you need the heart right away after birth. Um, so the heart transplant is not very often people choose to do the surgery first and then do a heart transplant when they are older. Yeah, so I'm um, wondering if it's when yeah. it's older if that reverses yeah. the liver phenotype. Yeah, so I I would imagine definitely it can do some benefit, but again, there's no clinical data now say e either way because 
there's just not enough. Uh, there is a new, yeah. Great, thank you. Sorry. Oh, we have another one. Dr. Trenner, have you guys tried periosin driven Cre deletion in HUR? And does it prevent uh, the heart similar to cardiomyocyte specific deletion? So. Uh, yeah, I mean, we we, we have, uh, the data is not complete on that yet. We're still working through that. I think one one issue with the periosin driven Cre, right, is the timing of knockout. And so, you know, if when it depends on whether you're looking at that initial knockdown to stop activation. And if that's the case, then I think the periosin Cre comes on a little too late and the, the gene goes down once the cells are already active. So I have a feeling that model is going to be a little bit more uh, useful to us in looking at the reversion of the phenotype. So that's kind of what, what we're hoping to use that for. But we do we do have the periostin Cree. We are employing it, um, but I can't really speak to much of that data just yet. Um, one one thing I'll say, I'll give a shameless plug while there's still a few people left on. Um, and we we have moved. Uh, we're growing. So we are looking for postdocs if, if anybody out there is listening and interested. Okay, I guess if there's no more questions, Mark, you can finish your wrap up. Sure, yeah. So again, thank you all for joining. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mike and Nate for presenting and Jessica for moderating. Um, and please look for uh, additional emails from us um, regarding the seminars that we plan or will be planning um, next year. Uh, if we follow the same schedule from uh, this year, we'll probably have something in March. Uh, so please be on the lookout and again, reach out if you're interested in being part of the committee or presenting. So uh, thank you all for joining and uh, have a wonderful weekend. Great. Thank you to the speakers and thanks. Thank you. Mark. Have a good weekend, everybody.